Thank you for joining the class. We're very excited today. We've got Tom Malloy, and I love to work with Tom. He's so knowledgeable about making films, funding films. So we have a great class set up for you today. Nice to see you come in. Hi, Nicholas. Gosh, great. Nice to see you, Allison, Connie. Thank you. So uh, let's get started. Uh, I want to introduce you to our moderator today, who is Adam Hayes. He's worked with From the Heart for a long time. Nahid, who always does this work, is out in Kenya on safari. So we all have to send him a lot of good luck getting oh. photographs. He's a great photographer. So Adam's going to give us the update of an outline for class today. So Adam, let's hear it. Thank you so much for having me, Carol and Tom. So From the Hearts of 501c3 nonprofit supporting independent filmmakers. We offer sponsorship for all media projects and the sponsorship gives you education and allows your donors to get a tax deduction for their donations to your film. We have five Roy W. Dean grants a year. The next grant is our spring grant, closing March 31st of 2024. And we also have a short film grant that closes April 30th of 2024. All info is on our website at fromtheheartproductions.com. And you're going to find a tremendous amount of information on film funding, everything from crowdfunding to goal setting. We created these everything you want to know classes to keep you updated with our fast changing industry. <clears throat> Our class today is about film funding. Everyone is muted right now, but we encourage you to ask questions. We're gonna have a time for Q&A a little later in the class. So just go ahead and put your questions in the chat and I'll ask Tom for you um, at that time. So the outline for today's class, is Carol Dean is going to interview Tom Malloy. He's a multi-hyphenate, very talented producer, writer, director, actor. And at the close of class, we're gonna have some questions and some awards for film buffs. Carol's created some film questions about classic films that we all love. The first one to put the answer in the chat bar is the winner. And the winners are gonna get a copy of the book, Perfecting Your Pitch, and uh, as well as Carol's three hour, How to Fund Your Film class. So that's our outline for today. And turning back over to you, Carol. Carol Dean, president of From the Heart. Hi, thank you so much, Adam. Well, Tom has done a marvelous job in writing, producing, directing, and acting. Uh, one of my favorite films that he recently did is called Ask Me to Dance. So mm -hmm. Tom, not, uh, Tom raised the money. He uh, had written a script uh, w about dancing and uh, he was on the phone. This is a story as I remember it, Tom, I hope I'm right. Sure. He was right. Uh, to a potential funder uh, another pitch. And as they were closing, the guy said, uh, you don't have any films about dancing, do you? And Tom said, yes, of course I do. Yeah. No, it's it 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 close. It was the other way. It was a different pitch for a different movie and he wasn't interested. And I did say, I thought about just saying, well, you know, maybe something in the future. And then I said, well, I have this dance movie script. And then he was like, my wife's a dancer. And that's how, <laughs> so it was me that initiated it and uh, got lucky. So, yeah. That was wonderful because that in that film is when you became a director. I imagine you've been directing in your head for a long time, but yeah. not only produced it, you raised the money, you uh, wrote the script, you uh, hired the crew, you got everything together, and then you directed it and acted in it. That's a true independent filmmaker. So I'll turn it over to you, Tom. Please share your information. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, thank you, Carol. And uh, geez, I appreciate my big, big bio on there, on the uh, screen there. Um, you know, last year I produced five movies last year and I have um, a bunch in the queue. And yeah, I mean, it's like I raised um, tons of money for films and you know the and i'm kind of also right on the pulse of what films can kind of go for let's put it that way like because i also own a film sales company called glass house distribution i'm sure that's mentioned it somewhere in the, the bio there but uh and i go to all the film markets and you know it's the the first thing that i would start out by saying and then before we get to your interview questions is that it, you know the state of the film business is 
is different and it's changed, you know, when it used to be these DVDs and um, pre-sales and the foreign sales and, and just a couple sales here and there to get your budget back. It's now TVOD, SVOD, AVOD, um, which, you know, for those that don't know what VOD is, video on demand, and the three being transactional, mm -hmm. which, uh, yeah, transactional, which is iTunes, you know, you pay a transactional fee, a uh, voodoo, you know, those type, type of things where um, you pay a transaction to watch content. And that could also be PVOD falls under there, which is premium VOD. Uh, and that's where it's still in theaters and it's $20 or something like that. Um, and then you move on to that SVOD window, which is your Netflix's and, um, it, you know, where you pay a subscription fee and that's subscription VOD and you you have access to all the content. And then you have the third, which is the uh, ad based VOD, which is your 2B and your Pluto and your YouTube and, um, uh, you know, the ones where you can watch anything for free, but you have to watch ads. And so that's kind of where it's been in it. And the, the old economy of uh, making more off of less, a couple of sales here and there, it's become making it less off of more. You got to be on a ton of platforms, especially um, internationally. We, my company really has a big focus on international sales, but in the U.S., uh, domestically, you have to be on as many platforms as possible. But the, what I get, guess the, the only reason that I'm kind of bringing this up, that kind of state of the union, is in movies, I, it, something hit me just recently, is that if I was to make anything uh manufacture something like let's just say a widget you know whatever it is um and it cost me five dollars for each widget to manufacture it and i found out the market was paying two dollars <laughs> per widget that's i mean meaning that's that's what people are willing to pay that's a that's a failure business before i even go into it right and i just throwing it out that i think a lot of people it's not that that's you know movies are always going to be less or whatever is that if you don't understand the market, you don't understand what uh, buyers are paying and VODs paying, you know, it's very, it's a big mistake to kind of go into there, you know, because you might be doing something where you're making a movie for X and the market, whatever that movie is, the market's only going to support, you know, one third of X. And um, the way to kind of combat that is to define the correct budget for your movie or documentary or whatever it is. Um, and then obviously one thing, but then also, go to film markets, you know, I'll be in, um, in Berlin in February and then, uh, MIP in April and then Cannes in May and then, uh, MIP com in, in, uh, October and then, uh, most likely Toronto and then American film market. And it's like, you don't have to go to all those, <laughs> you know, there's one next week called Natby that I decided even our company didn't want to go to that. This is more TV focused, but just going to markets you know going to anybody that's making documentaries it's like go to real screen and see that even if you don't get a sale from there you understand the market a lot more so that's that's my first thing advice to you um before going into it but the other things i want to touch on again before we kind of go to these questions is is um if if you were to look i, I try to think of it as like what do you want to hear and if you were to say what do I need to do to get my film or documentary done this year? You know, how do I get it made this year? Like, what is what are the steps that I need to take? And um, I think that you could start with three steps on there. Is that one is how uh, how are you going to sell distribute it? You know, which I've alluded to by going to these markets. How are you going to sell it? How are you going to distribute it? Where? How is that going to be uh, done? And you should have a plan again going in. It's the widget scenario. You know, you don't want to just make something and then see what happens. You know what I mean? Like, let me get an idea. So the, you, you you could potentially answer those questions by talking to a sales agent or meeting a sales agent distributor and have an idea of what the market supports. The second question I'd say, getting your movie or documentary this year, do you have a business plan? So you 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 idea you how to sell it or distribute it. Do you have a business plan that's going to put this all together and show what you're raising and all that stuff? And then the third, I would say, how is your pitch? Is your pitch ready to go? You know, and this is stuff obviously that you know you you and I have been teaching for a while Carol we go through the business plan on our class we go through the pitch and all that and and how to pitch better in fact that's always as you know my favorite class it's actually how we met is a, a was a live in person pitch class at, at Raleigh Studios gosh it had to be 10 plus years ago now um but you know so did, was it was it like yeah you know the date or no almost 19 years John oh my god god time flies <laughs> I'm getting older. Yeah. So it's, uh, I guess I've been doing this for a long time, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, so those are three things like how are you going to sell, distribute it, um, 
do you have a business plan? Do you have a pitch? You know, and then it's like going back to thinking about what you need to prepare before you go into making that film or documentary, right? And the first question I would ask is uh, your selection of genre, you know, focusing on your selection of genre, especially on a feature. Um, I I mean, I this again, just from being in the market, you look and you go, all right, action always sells. Uh, Sci-fi does very well. Thriller does went very well. Horror, yeah, horror, there's a lot of them. That's the problem is that you go to AFM, you think you have the greatest horror movie, you go to AFM and you see 2,000 horror movies all being sold. But horror is still good. It's still genre. Family is good or anything vanilla-ish, you know, a drama that's non-offensive. The hardest genre to sell that I tell people, God, you got to try to stay away is the edgy comedy with curse words everywhere and drug use and the edgy drama. And funny enough, the edgy drama is like the number one movie that every independent filmmaker wants to make. And trust me, I've made them. I know it. I know that people want to make them and it's their big thing and their Oscar play and all that stuff. But it's like, it's, there's the toughest to sell. So if you want to make a drama, I say, try to make it vanilla and family friendly. It doesn't have to be all, you know, uh, roses and, and things like that, but it has to be something where it's, it's a non-offensive thing because it just could sell much more. And the same with comedy. You know, you could as long as you can make it vanilla where a whole family can watch it, great. You can do very well with those movies. And we have done very well with the vanilla dramas and, and comedies. But what I'm getting at is that, you know, the edginess is something that you, you have to look at and you go, it's it's just not going to sell internationally and, and, and even domestically. You know, you want to make a, a movie, a, a really edgy movie about college dorm life in, in New York City, you know, and uh, that's not going to play in the Midwest is that going to play, you know, it's really only going to play in New York city, <laughs> maybe San Francisco and LA, you know what I mean? Like it's just, you know, the major cities. So you're, you're limiting your audience, but I, what I'm getting at is genre selection is so important. You know, um, obviously if the genre is a documentary, different story. Um, but in that case, I think the subject is, is very important. The selection of what is your documentary going to be about and what's going to set it apart in the market that people are going to want to be into watching it. Um, you know, so who buys it? I mean, that's the question. Who's going to buy your movie, right? At the end of the day, if you want to monetize your movie, who's going to buy it? You know, because there's two different things to always look at. There's the film funding, which I can teach all the steps in the film funding, how to get that money raised. But then there's the film sales, right? And the film sales is as important, you know, and ultimately that's what's going to lead to your long-term career. Right. If you just keep <laughs> raising money and not making any money for the movies, eventually you're going to burn through investors. And they're going to start asking questions going, what happened to the other five movies you did? You know, so you, if you could sell the movies and you monetize the movies, then you'll be much more successful. Um, so the other things that I also, also want to say that you should think about before going into it is, is your cast, you know, and, and even with documentaries, your cast, which is for your impact. And that helps with the investment. Right. Um, taking it on the feature film side, cast is so important. Right. And I've always been very good with getting good cast for movies. And that, I believe, comes to the thing that the last part I was going to say, which is your script and, you know, for your documentary, your idea, but having something that's really great. And if you can get a great script, a killer script, you can get that cast. And if you can get a cast that's exponentially more valuable than your movie, wow, you're in, you're in great shape. I mean, that, that's truly what drives so much of the foreign sales and domestic sales is they go, Oh, you know, Brian Cox is in this. I, you know, like we have a movie with Brian Cox right now. It was like, he's the star of succession, you know, the biggest show on HBO winning every Emmy uh, golden globes just won, swept them. And it's like, you know, that that's value. That's value to a movie that we sell. Um, and the same with uh, the documentaries, if you can get a narrator, you know, a narrator that's everybody, you know, it's the Morgan Freeman, you know what I mean? It's that type of thing, that narrator that's going to come in and kind of be the star of your film or a subject matter, a person that you're interviewing. And I've seen it where people, there's been A-list stars interviewed in a documentary um, or a, a music, you know, a band or something like that that has a following. Again, thinking about it from a marketing perspective, thinking of how many eyeballs are going to see your documentary um, or how many eyeballs are going to see your movie, right? If you, you're casting your movie and you have a an actor or actress that has a huge social media following as well uh, as being a great actor and a known actor that's just going to help you kind of really in the long run. But really all of this goes to, and I won't go on too much longer and I, I, I want to get to the questions. I just, you know, the key is all of this is it's, there's no guarantees. 
There's no guarantees. I have done it where it's like, man, we are set with this. We got everything in the right order and then didn't make money <laughs> uh, and vice versa where I was like, I hope we did it right. And then the movie did very well. So, uh, but all of it is stacking the deck in your favor. I mean, that's it. That's the most that I could teach you. That's the most that's with Carol and I, you know, teach a lot in the course is that here's how you stack the deck so that one, you have a financeable project that makes sense. It's the right budget. You have a great business plan, a great pitch on it, and you have the tools to raise the money. But then you're also thinking about the back end. You're also thinking about what's my market. And I know Carol does a ton with the social media marketing and then crowdfunding and stuff, stuff like that. Who are the people that's going to buy it? Who are the people that's going to, that are going to see it down the road instead of just going, Oh, let's give it to a distributor and they can, they can put it out there, you know, which is okay. And they will have a certain amount of reach. But if you help, I mean, we look at the movies that we've done well with, it's the ones where the filmmakers helped as well that have done much more business than the ones where it's just like, here, pick it and you just go, you know? Um, so anyway, that's kind of my spiel as far as the state of the film business goes and what you should be thinking about. I hope I answered that question. If it's like, if you say you want to get your movie going this year, it's like, um, uh, you know, how are you going to sell it? What do you have a business plan? Do you have a pitch? You know, if you're just going, oh, I'm going to do this movie and I'm going to raise a million dollars, but it's just in your head. That's not enough. You have to have something on paper, an idea, a plan, business plan, a pitch, so that you're going to walk into it and go, all right, my cards are stacked in the, in, you know, in the, in the right way going into it to make the potential biggest upside. Right. And that's what I'll give you. <laughs> How about a question, Adam? Oh. Yeah, we have several questions uh, from our chat. So regarding the business plan, does this include um, impact campaign strategies? What, as far as you, you're talking about marketing, like in the business plan, you're talking about marketing campaign strategies. Is that was that you mean? It says impact campaign strategies. Well, I'm, I'm assuming the marketing campaign, you know, and, and I, I believe that's what they're talking about here is that, yes, of course. I mean, you know, if, if you have in the business plan a page on there that says that we already have a mailing list of 30,000 people and you know, every post we do gets X amount of views and stuff like that. That's just great. I mean, you know, you're just, again, adding more value to the, whatever the project is so that when people are um, searching for it, you know, they, they, they know about it, you know, and it's when released and it's released on all these platforms, they can access it and, you know, and they, because they've heard about it. So yeah, hundred percent. Well, wait, I want to say that you're, uh, business plan, Tom, is the best one I have ever seen. I highly recommend it for everybody because you've used it. And every time you've found a word or something has to be changed, you make the change. So it's always updated and you don't have to get a, an attorney to vet it. It's perfect. All you have to do is fill it in, right? And start. Yeah, it's kind of plug and play, you know? Yeah. The, and, and we go over that, you know, we go through that with everybody in the class and it's like, it is, it's really plug and play. Um, which is because it's not it's not like a legal document. It's more of like it's here's an overview. You know, we're just talking here. And I think that's the best way. I don't think it's I think it's a mistake to walk into an investor meeting with a big legal document. I, I've equated that to walking into a first date and I'm like, you know, I have this brochure here where we could potentially get married. It's really <laughs> perfect. And here's all the details. But I'm going to put that over here. Let's talk. I, you know, I'm not getting a second date. Let's put it that way. So I think that, you know, going in with an overview is much smarter to begin with and much more apt to close money that way. So, well, tell yeah. people where they can find that because it's really valuable. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. It's at movieplanpro.com. Uh, and so maybe I'll just type it into the chat. Do, do, do. Let's see. And Tom, well, I, I want to say that in yeah. Filmmaker Magazine a few months back, some women took... Uh, an analysis of filmmakers. They got filmmakers to tell them what their budget was and what they sold the film for and if they made any money. And what they came up with was uh, that aside from the golden elevator where you're funded going in and you have no worries, mm -hmm. uh, the other people that are making money are those who can sell the film for 100000 That's the biggest money making, over 100000 very little income, 500,000, forget about it. That's what they found. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to see that article. It's like, you know, look, I'm not going to say that there is a 
there's not a market for the movies that are uh, millions of dollars because there is, but you have to be a little bit smarter with that. There has to be cast involved. There has to be distribution involved. Uh, you know, one of the films I made last year was in the over $2 million range and had some big stars and big distributors attached. And then one of the films that I made that um, I was, I was a co-financier on was a little under $50,000. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and so there's ways to make that. I just did a course called Backyard Blockbuster, where I'm talking about how to make, you know, a an indie as tightly as possible if you haven't made anything before and this is how you want to start because now you have a feature that's done. Now, I'm not saying, again, all budgets have to be $30,000, $40,000, $50,000. No, it's not that. It's just that you have to have the right budget for your project. And if it's a first-time director with no-name actors and it's, um, you know, it's not a perfect genre then it's probably smart to keep it as little as possible. Okay. So Adam, you go next. Any more questions? Thank you. Yes, from Howard, how detailed does your business plan need to be? Can the business uh, basic business details be added or combined with parts of the pitch deck to sell your film? Yeah, I mean, that's basically what Movie Plan Pro is. It's, it's a combination of a pitch deck and some elements of the business plan. You know, the key is, again, you don't want to get too crazy with the... Um, the legal speak and stuff like that in the document, it's still an overview, but usually a pitch deck will have more of pictures and moods and stuff like that. And, you know, and, and cast ideas versus mine kind of sits in the middle where it's like, here are the details of the film. Here's uh, the synopsis and all that stuff. Here are the bios, the people involved. Here is the money that we're looking to raise. And here's a potential ROI if money comes back to the film. So it has those elements in there that again, you wouldn't put in a pitch deck, the actual numbers, but you would put it in this, which again, it's called a confidential informational overview, which is kind of legal speak for, we're just talking here, just giving you, you know, informational overview of what we're doing. Thank you. Uh, Giovanni is asking, how do we find those lists of what studios or buyers are looking for? Well, there's no real lists. I mean, you know, it's, it's, there are, it's funny, there, there's lists like, I was just reviewing mandates from TV networks, like what they're looking to uh, do in the, this was specific to the unscripted space, like to crime shows or this, to, you know, or <laughs> wives cheating on each other's show, you know, whatever, those, those type of things. What And it had the mandates for each network. There's really not as much, and I, I don't know of any list that exists, except for you can go to, uh, and I'll type this in the chat too, sanando.com. Sanando, oops. Uh, dot com where that's the database the database for all the sales agents and distributors and if you go to that and you look up the distributors that are you know the the, the bigger ones and the medium ones that are dealing in certain spaces you can see what they bought you can see the movies that they're buying the movies that they're selling and go okay all right that's i see the level of cast that they have and now obviously it'll be defined when you have Voltage or Highland or one of the biggest companies, they're going to have big, gigantic stars in the movies. And then you go all the way down to the smallest, you know, companies that are um, that have the no names in the movies. But at least you could see, OK, uh, I'm seeing some trends here, but there's no actual like list where it's like, oh, here's what people are buying and this is what they're looking for. But I think it, as long as you stick what I was saying with those genres, I think you're in the best shape possible. Terrific. So, yeah, on the topic of genres, question from Thomas. Um, so different genres for narrative film selling differently. What about for documentaries? Are there topics that are easier or harder to sell in the current market? And he's also asking about format. Is there anything trending in terms of like on-screen host versus omniscient narrator or format that are better to sell at the moment? It's so tough. I, do, I can't say because it's like there's times where it's, you know, we'll say something. We we developed some a bunch of unscripted shows. We had a, a guy... Sam Thompson that was working with us as our head of, of television for Glasshouse, my company. And it was like, you know, there was, oh, wait, this narrator, narrator's not in anymore. You know, and it's like, the thing is, they those, those mandates change. And then suddenly it's like, narrators are in, you know. I can only go by what buyers have asked. You know, like when I told you about the genres things, and the first thing out of my mouth was action, it's because that's the first thing out of every buyer's mouth. You know, it's like, what genres are you looking for? They go, well, action. And then they list whatever after that, but they always start with that. So I look and I go, well, that's smart. You know, I can see why you should make an action movie. 
But the one thing I'll just say that I get a lot of requests for uh, documentaries or music in sports. So music-based documentaries and sports-based documentaries, whether it's a band or something like that, or it's a um, some type of sports team or you know that type of story. Those are two that I know buyers have asked me for. Well, can I just say that there's a, a new documentary out called Four Daughters. I, it's incredible. It's spellbinding. I don't, I'm halfway through it. I don't know where the story is going. I've never seen anything like it before. It's totally engaging, throws everything we know about documentaries out the window, and it's winning all kinds of awards. So I recommend take a look at that. Yeah. And, and also, I recommend um, uh, what it, Dick Johnson is dead because uh, she right. wild uh, it, with that film, had a wonderful time. Criterion bought it. When Criterion buys a documentary, that's like the gold star. Mm -hmm. so, I would say, see those, well, if you want to see outside the box, new, yeah. innovative. And that's really good. You know, it's like, yes, the, the, the bottom line is if there's an, it's a great film, it, it really doesn't matter. You know, I, I, we, I talked at one point that one of my favorite documentaries of all time was called the King of Kong. And I mean, I guess theoretically it could be a sports thing, but it was about the Donkey Kong world championships, but anybody that's seen that knows, man, that was like the best documentary. And so it really can be about anything. I don't want to discourage that. I'm just saying, if you want to stack the deck in your favor, you know, maybe if it's some obscure topic, about your grandmother, you know, or something like that. It's like, okay, not a lot of people know that going in, but ultimately, ultimately, if you make an incredible work, um, that should speak for itself. Right. Thanks, Tom. Great question um, from Celia. Do you recommend producing a short documentary first to see if it has a viable product before moving forward with the feature length? That's a tough question i don't i don't know you know it, it depends look at i as far as short films first that's a slippery slope as well because sometimes with the short films your the production value isn't there the actors aren't there and so it's it i've seen that where people have said you know let me let me do a sizzle or a short and it's you know, it, it's lost them the job you know i can think of one where i was like ready to fund this guy's movie and and saw his concept trailer and i was like yeah, and he can't direct this movie <laughs> he lost the job because of that so i would say you know it's it, I, i'm on the fence if you can make something that is enticing a short documentary that's enticing and you know that could lead to the feature potentially you know and potentially that could be something um but if you're doing it and then it doesn't really encompass the story and you don't really get to what you want to tell I don't know, you know, that might just be spinning your wheels, so to speak. Right. It's difficult to decide because nowadays they have this thing uh, uh, where it's a proof of concept. And I feel like you do, that if you're, if you're doing a feature and you want to do a proof of concept, it's got to be really good to get your funding. Yeah. Now, for a documentary, that's a different story, a different world. Uh, so I don't know if you, how much content, how much of a story is it? If you can tell a story, a good story in 40 minutes, that may be the true length of the film because that's a good film to share with an audience when you want to create feedback and sell it as an interactive uh, product online where you would get people to talk about their problems, let's say solving a problem or uh, a film that works with the, with the audience. But otherwise, uh, I think you either go, I, I love hours in documentaries and I've seen people cut a 90 minute, have trouble selling it. When they cut it to 60, they, they make all kinds of sales. So mm -hmm. I lean towards a 60 minute doc as a way to make the most money. So we've answered you five different ways. I'm sorry, but that's what we know. <laughs> what next, Adam? Terrific. Um, Melissa is asking about uh, funding for short films, uh, aside from crowdfunding. If a film is not necessarily geared for distribution, what are some fundraising strategies? 
it's you know that's obviously very tough like short films making money you should you shouldn't ever go into a short film going i'm gonna make some money from this like that's not the reason to make shorts and um i would say yeah what you're talking about crowdfunding and is is obviously one of the ways to do it but the the second way and i think the best way and this applies to some documentaries too is what we call the vested interest approach. And it's one of the approaches that I use, one of the approaches I'm teaching the class of financing the project on anything other than the money, <laughs> you know, the back end money, because the shorts is not going to make money. And so there, there are certain ways to do that. What is that vested interest? Is it a role for the financier's husband or the financier's wife or the, you know, is it his daughter that he wants to give a role to? Is it a, um, is it, can you use their locations? You know, like maybe it's like, well, we'll pr promote this. What is that? What is the way to get them to put the money in that has nothing to do with, um, you know, we're going to make money on the back end. So that's the kind of way to do it, the vested interest approach. And there's, a, there's all aspects to closing somebody with that kind of vested interest angle. Um, but that's the way to do it. You know, the only other way I could see with a short is to promise them a, and on paper as well, give them a, uh, percentage of the feature you know and say that they would automatically be an executive producer of the feature and you know get x amount of points or whatever and they have first refusal to invest in that feature so that they go okay i understand the whole path of this project great we have a couple people just asking in general like best practices for fundraising for documentaries well, yeah, I mean, it's the same kind of thing. It's the vested interest approach. You know, it's like there's, we, again, we go into super details and I can do a whole three hours on the vested interest approach right now, but it's like, you know, ultimately there's, you, you have to documentaries, whether, what, what is the reason that you're going to get the finance here to get, to get involved? If it's about dolphins, you know, and they are a huge dolphin advocate, you know, it's about marine life or something like that. You can find the, the people that are donating. You find those donors lists of the people that are donating. And it's like, here, I'm doing a documentary about dolphins. And it's like, this is going to change certain things. Um, so you can do that. You know, it's like, so their vested interest is not about, oh, I make money in the documentary. It's like, I'm getting the word out about dolphins, you know, and it could be anything. It could be Donkey Kong. You know what I mean? It could be uh, that people want to get the word out about, about old video gaming, you know? So it, it's, again, it's, it's looking at any other aspect that's not just, here's the amount of money we're going to make this amount of money, you know? Question from Carrie. How about distribution for short documentaries in festivals or where else can they be sold? Well, it depends on how short, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're tough as well to make money. Um, look, international, AVOD. Look, the biggest the biggest AVOD platform is YouTube. The biggest AVOD platform is YouTube now. And it's like, it took a while for that to become a thing. And if you can, and, and it's like now we like we have movies that we, we have 100, almost 180 movies now that we've signed. And it's like, we take the older movies that are two, three years old, and we put them on YouTube worldwide. And we have partners, we have partners that have 20 million subscribers here, and then another 15 million. And, you know, and so that's going to generate. And I'd say on a short documentary, if you can get some of those bigger partners, uh, you know, I, just maybe five, six, seven companies that have the multi-million subscribers and um, they'll put your movie on YouTube. I think that's the best bet. Now, if you don't know those companies, it's like start looking, watch shorts on YouTube and see, all right, who's who's the channel here? Then you could reach out to the channel and say, you know, would you consider uh, airing my short and, and we'll do some kind of split whatever it is 50 50 and 75 25 whatever it is and you just get paid on the ad revenue great um howard is asking for some tips on getting actors if you're a first-time filmmaker how do you make it attractive enough and present it well the first i mean it always to me comes down to the script and it's so the actors i, I always say actors want to do great scripts and if the script is really great uh, they'll find a way to be involved. And I closed people that were so much bigger and we didn't have the anywhere near the money because they were into the script. So I think it starts um, out. I just saw somebody that asked about the YouTube. It's AVOD, A-V-O-D, ad-based V-O-D. But yeah, so I think a bunch of people just answered. Um, it's just, I'm sorry, that just happened to catch my eye in the corner here. Um, but um, 
uh, distribution. Wait, I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought with that. What were we going to say? What were we talking about, Adam? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, tip, tips on finding actors for a first time. Ah, finding actors. Okay. So yes, it comes down to the script is the first thing. The other thing is you could potentially partner with somebody, you know, pretty, get a pretty, it's, so your first time uh, director, first time producer, partner with a producer that, or a director that has those relationships already. You know, they've worked with so-and-so actor or this and that. Great. That's the person that you want to bring. Maybe even a DP that's worked with so-and-so actor. And so that's another way, um, you know, any connection that you can have for that. Um, and then I'd say the third way is to get a reputable casting director involved. You know, not a casting director just because they're, you know, they're they're really gung-ho and they want to work. No, no, no. You need somebody that's, go all right, what movies have they cast and what stars have they put into those movies? Right. This is so important, Tom. The yeah. casting director. Yeah. Absolutely. Because that really can make or break a film, I'll tell you. And 100%. Yeah. It's like to act. That's what you always tell us then. So you really, it's the script, I guess, like you started out with. If you have a really good script, you have a very good chance of getting uh, an A-list actor to be in it. Yeah, yeah. They want to do, actors want to do great scripts because they're so few and far between, you know, so they're excited about a great script. Right. Thank you, Howard. That was a good question. Another question about actors from Arun. How do you how do you determine the market value of an actor? Well, again, that's another thing where there's no like list, like, oh, you put so and so in, and that's you know, hundred thousand. It's there's not a thing like that. It's <laughs> look, there's there's no exact science there, but it's kind of like the one thing, one rule of thumb is do you need to explain the person now? It, I'm not saying that's the be all end all, but it is, it is something like meaning if I said Jack Black, you all know who that is. But if I said it's John Smith and you go, who's John Smith? And it's like, Oh, well, did you ever see shameless? Like in the second season, he was this guy. Okay. That's really not as powerful, you know, and you have to explain that person. Now there are times where it's come to me. I remember somebody said to me, they had a script and they had KJ Appa attached. And I go, who the hell is KJ? I have no idea who that is. And then I Googled him and he was the star of Riverdale. He was Archie on the show Archie, which is Riverdale, which is about the comic Archie. And he had 20 million subscribers, you know, on Instagram. And so I was like, yeah, of course, it's huge value. You know what I mean? Like, so it, it doesn't always work that way. But um, it, ugh, ultimately, it's it comes down to you just want to get somebody that is much bigger value than you, you thought, a name recognition. And staying away from the... <laughs> I hate to say it, but like the Eric Roberts of the world and uh, and Michael Madsen, it was my friend. And then Tom Sizemore, who was my friend, who passed away. And it was like, these are guys that it, I don't think, they do so many movies every year, hundreds. And I don't think that that's a real get in, in any way, shape or form. Thanks, Tom. Uh, from Deborah, a little background about her film and then a multi-part question. So I have a family-friendly fr film, a prize-winning script, a prize-winning director, a place to shoot, and a company that has a first look for distribution, but funding is a big issue. How do you find to approach potential investors? Do companies like Bonfire Media really work? Are they worth the money? Any suggestions other than crowdfunding? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it's like that's... The your financing, I, I, I'm i not a crowdfunder. I, I've raised, you know, it, it's funny that the 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 numbers 25 million plus but it's way more than that now i just have to, I have to recalculate it and go back over the last five years and be like let me add all these other ones up and it's like it's all been private equity it's not crowdfunding to get any of those things it's it's getting in the room with the person and they go all right yeah i'm in you know and, and closing those investors so there is so many techniques so many approaches i mean you know um I'm sure you've heard the, the class, the intentional filmmaking uh, class that Carol and I teach where we go for drill down into approaches for financing movies. And uh, but I, it's tough to just say do this or that because there's so much information there. And if anybody's also a fan of filmmaking stuff, which is I mean, that's basically what I teach is film financing and film distribution. And it's like so. You know, they, yeah, I mean, they, they, you're saying anything besides private equity. It's like, well, I'm saying, yeah, everything besides private. Yeah, I mean, everything besides crowdfunding, you know, crowdfunding to me is 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 here and there's a value to it. And Carol is much more of an expert on that than I am. But it's like I'm into closing private equity. I'm into closing investors for movies. That's that's the way to do it, especially if you have all those aspects in place. Um, 
I think that you you just need the right pitch and the right business plan, and you could be successful. Right, very important. From Timothy, are you usually trying to sell your film before going into production so you can leverage the distribution for financing? Can you talk about that part of the process? It depends. You know, we we're saying sell the movie before that's different you know versus having a distributor attached or sales agent attached which doesn't mean you know you're not there's no money transactions just xyz films is selling my movie i think that's extremely smart and um most of the movies that i've done recently have had that right where we had i mean now i obviously, obviously have my own sales company as well but it's like there's been ones where we just go in and we got we have much bigger sales agent attached and before we go in um but if it's something where you're talking about selling it before, like say you go to Tubi and you know you have a Tubi original and they're going to give you three hundred thousand dollars for the Tubi original and on a negative pickup, and you're shooting it for hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars. Well, it's like, well, that's easy. <laughs> you know that, that money's easy to get. You'd probably give a get a bank to loan that to you, but it, getting the financing for that is cake. So it's look, it's not always easy to do if you get the right cast and you have the right connections potentially you can get an actual number sale before going in, but adding a sales agent distributor before you shoot a hundred percent in. And I wouldn't, I don't want to say easy. It almost came out easy, but I will say it's doable, you know, going to these markets, going to can, going to Berlin, going to, EF, uh, to EFM and meeting with these sales agents, establishing relationship and then going from there and getting them attached. Are you going to can this year, Tom? Oh, of course. You? Oh Yeah. Well, actually, I can't. So the Can uh, Film Festival slash Film Market, we always have a booth there in the Riviera. So every year, my whole team's there. But I also do go to Can, the city, twice as well. MIP TV, which is in April, which is a TV slash film market, and MIPCOM, which is in October. Last year, I had to skip MIP TV, and but I was there for Can and then MIPCOM. But uh, yeah, so I'll be in France three times this year. But uh, Cannes is the biggest. I mean, that's also has the festival going on at the same time. So which is amazing. Biggest in the world. And it's a great place to meet people and talk uh, uh, money for films. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, it's like I've done so much can just walking around and, and making connections. Incredible. Yeah. OK, thanks. My favorite. Mark is asking about how do you determine the value of a short film on the market and how do you recommend improving the value of a standalone short that has no intention of becoming a feature? I mean, you know, it's, it's it comes back to, I, I don't think there's much of a market for shorts financially. If that, if your goal is you're doing a short for financial reasons, well then it should be something where it, you have a, a, a market beforehand going in like there's an the amount of people that I'm going to sell this short film to um, you could eventually put it on YouTube internationally and around the world and get the partners and get that AVOD money. Great. You know, that that's all doable, but that shouldn't be the reason that you're doing the short. Again, I only think it's, it's great for a calling card um, maybe to prove to yourself that you can make a movie, then move on to the feature. Um, or it is the a concept of the of the feature that you're ultimately going to do, or, or the same genre, or something like that. But um, making a short in and of itself to be financially successful, I have not figured out the way to do that, and I don't know of people that have figured out the way to do that. Is there a way? Okay, I don't know, but um, that's not. I don't think that's the right path. Right. Just my opinion. Okay. So, Catherine, we'll take Catherine's uh, question, and I think we're going to have to close it. Thank you. I was just wondering how or what you look for in distribution with your company. Like what, because I made a feature and I'm seeking distribution right now, but it's hard to know what exactly independent distributors are looking for. And everyone's different. Yeah, you know, they all are different. But again, I think they all think the same type of thing. If they if there's the certain elements that are in it, those genres that I was talking about, um, and and staying away from the edgy dramas and the edgy comedies well then there's potentially a market for it you know we have a guy um that's worked for me for five years now david josh lawrence who's our head of acquisitions you know and he's the person that reviews all the movies so he's got his own types of tastes and you know it's it's he's got to see if it if it could um 
uh, reach out. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm sorry. Let, let me give you the correct email. If you're talking about glass head distribution, let's give Tom a glass head distribution. <laughs> As I see one of my personal email addresses being shared there, it's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is the Tom at glass head distribution email. That's the that's the distribution email. And um, but yeah, I mean, you know, ultimately, it's um, look. Ultimately, we look for good movies. You know, if it's a good movie, if there's any cast in it. Obviously, that's much we're much more in a better position to sell it and do well in the sales if there's some cast in it. But if there's not, if it fits into one of the genres, a sci-fi, a drama. I mean, we just signed a sci-fi drama that was much more drama than sci-fi that has no names on it. And, uh, you know, we'll see where it goes. So it's all kinds of movies, just good movies. And, and there's a lot of uh, us sales agents that are looking for great movies as well. Thank you so much. Great. Tom, this is so much great information. Thank you very much. Perfect. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me as always. And, uh, you know, I love talking with you and talking with filmmakers. So honored to be here. And uh, thank you all for listening. Yes. Great advice. Great information. Good luck with your next films. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> great. Okay. I will jump off and leave it in, hand, in Carol's hands. Thank you so much. Adam, I'm going to leave it up to you next to Let's talk about, uh, oh, film, it's the film buff time. So that's great. Uh, all right. So I've put together some questions uh, and I'm getting tougher. We, we've had some easy questions, but now I think it's time to start talking about directors when you talk about uh, statements from films that we would recognize who was the director on the film. So the first question is, name the director of the film with this quote. Every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. You probably know the film. All right, we have a winner. A lot of people answering correctly. Oh, good. Let's see, the first one was from Jonathan Glendening, Frank Capra. Yes, Frank Capra. What a great group of films he gave us. And he's so terrific at creating those wonderful scripts. Now, name the director of the film with this quote, just put your lips together and whistle and blow, sorry, and blow. Just put your lips together and blow. That's a little tougher, but you should re remember who said that. May We're West. looking for the name, name of the director. Yeah. Okay. It's an old film back probably in the 40s or 50s. Uh, I had uh, Bogart and his partner, Lauren Bacall. Okay. Not we'll seeing see. it yet. What? Not seeing the right answer yet. Okay, keep guessing. All right. So we'll go to a, a more modern film, 1983 movie. Actor Tom Cruise dances in his underwear to the song Old Time Rock and Roll. So what's the name of that film? Okay, oh, we, we, have, we have a winner again. Uh, so, so many coming in. One sec. All right, well, Jonathan got that one first again, but he already won one. So the next one was from Carrie Letterer for Risky Business. And then also Celia got Howard Hawks for the last question. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> Howard Hawks, yeah. I'm making a Howard note of these. Not is a great film. Oh, she was so beautiful and they worked together so well. Um, okay, let's uh, go to... Um, that's it for the day. Those are the ones. But uh, I think that to, uh, for documentary, uh, watch the uh, the short list for what's happening, what's coming, because it's morphing. I mean, that's this four daughters throws everything we know about the structure of a documentary out the window, and you are just. Uh, mesmerized what's the story and the story keeps unfolding and it's so good uh 
So, uh, Adam, we are having a class. I'm going to have a class with Tom. We have two classes a year. And so this is our uh, first class for 2024. We only take a few people because we like to be able to give you personal consultations. So we teach information about funding and your mindset, because if you don't believe you can do it, it's really hard to do. You have to believe you can do it. So we work on that. We cover all the bases for uh, film funding, parties, crowdfunding, but most important is how to sell yourself, how to sell your film and be so polished. And then where do you go to meet people and how do you get to sit down and talk to them? Because that's where you really close big money. So this is the information about the class. I'll uh, turn it over to you to Adam. If any of you would like to join us, you're very welcome. Yeah, we'd like to invite each of you. Please join the intentional filmmaking class. It's absolutely incredible class where you get personal access to Tom and to Carol to go in depth into a number of topics. So cover covering a six month funding action plan, how to perfect your pitch fine tuning and reconstructing your proposal, how to find strategic partners and finding those high net worth investors and donors and a lot more. This is for anyone that has a documentary short film feature or series that needs to raise some money. And it's a class that's taught over Zoom so you can take it from anywhere in case you miss it, they are recorded. And everyone that attends is gonna get three personal consultations, with Carol and Tom. Uh, we have a special that if you roll in the next week, by January 18th, you'll get $150 with a discount code. Um, classes begin February 26th. And we also have another discount code for people um, who joined us here today, which is Tom50. That's going to give you another $50 off, which makes the class just $580. Um, so please try to enroll early if you'd like to join by January 18th. Classes start February 26th. We hope to see you there. Great. Thank you so much. But I want to close to remind you that you're the, the greatest asset we have. You're our independent filmmakers. You bring us some of the greatest innovations and the best films. You've always put the studios uh, on, made it hard for them because independents come up with such things films that the studios have to take your lead so don't forget that it's who you are it's your right to get out there and make your films and stay unique and creative because you are original thinkers so remember that you are an artist and you're highly gifted so i want to close with this statement that independent filmmaker jane campion two-time academy award winner uh, she blessed us with so many fabulous films like The Piano and The Power of the Dog. Here's what she wrote to herself when she graduated from film school, and it is a great daily reminder to all of us. She said, you must decide to be creative, not wait to be. You must challenge yourself. Pick up the brush, grab hold of the camera, turn on the computer, start cooking the meal, go to the workplace early, propose the solution, advance the idea, and become the answer. That's what it's all about. Thank you so much for joining us and best of luck. Thank you, Adam, for taking care of all of us. <laughs>